Chapter 5 Over the Hump with Boston Because time changes as the earth turns, it was two hours later in Nebraska than in California, so Doc Brink was well on his way when Sam Hamilton galloped up to Sportsman's Hall and turned the eastbound mail over to Warren Upson. But the name Upson does not appear on most lists of Pony Express riders. In its place, one finds Boston, nickname for the five-foot, twenty-year-old boy who carried the first pony mail over the big hump of the Sierra Nevadas. Boston was the son of a wealthy California publisher, but from earliest childhood, his only interest had been in horses and mountains. He loved them both and understood their every mood and trick. He could tame the wildest bronco, knew the Sierras as well as Kit Carson knew the Rockies, and had ridden trails that only he and the Indians had ever seen. Sam Hamilton's fear had been that night would overtake Boston among the high peaks. Boston himself knew there would be no possible chance of getting through unless he reached the summit before three o'clock. With a northeast gale blowing, there would be twenty to thirty foot snow drifts on the high range by late afternoon, and mule trains would be unable to keep the trail open. The first five miles of Boston's route lay along a heavily timbered divide, rising ruggedly to the south rim of the American River Gorge. Then, for six miles, the trail pitched steeply down a rocky mountainside to the river, a drop of nearly a thousand feet, until he reached the rim. Boston kept his pony at a pounding trot, sparing it only on the steepest rises. That gait would shake a man's liver loose, but it was the safest and fastest way to travel an icy trail. A galloping horse would tire faster and was twice as apt to slip, fall, and break a leg. Where the trail pitched down to the river, Boston dismounted and drove the pony before him, carrying a rider's weight. A tired pony couldn't possibly keep its footing on the sleet-covered rocks, but riderless, a mountain mustang could slide like an expert skier, slipping, sliding, catching their balance against trees, and plunging on. Boston and the pony slithered to the bottom of the gorge, no more than a brook in dry times. The south fork of the American River was in flood, sixty feet wide at the ford, and littered with dead wood. It swirled through the S-shaped gorge like a great snake writhing in anger. After studying the racing water for a minute or two, Boston took the mochila from his saddle, tossed it around his shoulders, and mounted. He rode upstream for forty yards, then carefully poised the pony on a ledge at the river's brink. Watching for a clear stretch of water between the dead wood, he drove his spurs hard, at the same moment swinging the mochila above his head. At the strike of Boston Spurs, the Mustang leaped far out over the swirling water, dropped and went under in a geyser of splashing foam. In an instant, its head bobbed to the surface, and it struck out for the far bank, driving with all the strength of its sturdy legs. 
Boston had judged the current well. The pony's hoofs hit bottom, right where the trail dipped down to the ford, and it scrambled, dripping up the bank. Boston was soaked to the armpits, but the mail was still dry. Knowing he would be in for a wetting, he made preparations for it. In a cedar grove just beyond the river, he had a relay man waiting with a fresh pony, a roaring fire, and dry clothing. Within three minutes from the time he had come out of the river, Boston had changed clothing and was again riding rapidly up the trail. From the ford, the trail followed the north side of the river to its source at the foot of the high western rampart of the Sierras. Only a few feet above the angry river at some places, but more than a thousand at others, the trail twisted and wound upward, clinging to the steep mountain sides. Halfway up lay Hope Valley, given its name because there was hope for any blizzard-bound traveler who succeeded in getting that far out of the high mountains. For a man going in, it might well have been named Hopeless. Early April blizzards were not uncommon in the high mountains, but Boston had never known one to be this cold. Sweeping across the snow fields, at the summit of the range. The wind raced down through the V-shaped funnel of the gorge in a freezing blast. He bent his head against it and kept his pony at a trot wherever the trail was not too steep. Snow was beginning to drift around the Hope Valley relay station when Boston plodded up on his exhausted pony his muscles were already stiffening with the cold, but he would not stop to thaw them out or to eat. Hard as he had driven, it had taken two and a half hours to make the twenty-mile ride from Sportsman's Hall. Gulping a cup of steaming coffee, he slipped the mochila onto his next mount and was away up the trail within two minutes. Above Hope Valley, the gorge narrowed. The drop-off to the river became nearly straight down. And the trail climbed steeply along the canyon wall. Two miles out, fine blowing snow closed in like smothering powder, blotting out the chasm to Boston's right and the towering mountainside at his left. The drifts began to deepen and low bent saplings often blocked the trail. Two miles an hour was considered fair time for a pack train over this part of the trail in good weather. Boston was determined to travel at better than twice that speed. Out of the saddle nearly as much as in it. He helped his pony along by climbing a foot where the trail was the steepest. Plowing ahead through drifts and hunting out the quickest and safest way around the blockades. Boston carried no watch, but he had a mountain man's inboard inborn sense of time, <clears throat> and drove himself and his pony ruthlessly to hold to the pace he had set. On the high headlands, close to the chasm rim, the gale swept the trail clear of snow, threatening to sweep Boston and his pony with it. In the lee of the mountain shoulders, the drifts piled higher with each succeeding mile before reaching the next relay station they had plowed 
through a dozen shoulder-high drifts and were forced to make three treacherous detours around blockades. Even so, the first six miles up from Hope Valley were made in an hour and ten minutes. The change of mounts took only the two minutes allowed by regulations, but between swallows of hot coffee, Boston asked, What happened to the mule trains Pete didn't see a sign of them? All up toward the summit, the station keeper answered, Snow's a blowin' terrible up there. Drifts nigh on to thirty foot deep. Don't you go tryin' to get through alone, Boston. You get behind a mule train, so's it can break fresh trail for you. Don't you worry, Pete. I'll make out, was all Boston said as he climbed into the saddle and headed back into the storm. The five miles to Strawberry, the next relay post, were much like the six before them, except that the drifts were deeper and the temperature dropped with every rise of the trail. Boston had to begin saving his own strength for the upper rampart but was determined to hold a four-mile pace. Without his help, the pony tired rapidly. It was barely able to drag itself through the drifts on the last half-mile climb to Strawberry. Still, nothing had been seen of the mule trains. All the station keeper could tell Boston was, ain't saw hide nor hair of them but Yancey's supposed to be bustin' trail twixt here and Yanks. You'd best wait up Boston. If Yancey can't make it with six mules, you ain't got a chance with that little cayuse. Boston knew the man might be right, but as he swung onto a waiting pony, he shouted above the howl of the wind, Keep that coffee hot, Charlie. Reckon I know where Yancey is, and he'll need it when he gets out. Then he spurred away into the whiteness of the storm. Two miles above Strawberry, Boston found Yancey and his mules right where he expected to find them. Here the trail skirted a solid rock mountain shoulder, dipping in around a deep pocket. The wind had swept the shoulder naked forming a whirlwind in the pocket and dropping a thirty-foot drift of feathery snow. Yancey had driven his mules back and forth across the drift all morning, trying to keep a solid trail packed. Then, halfway across, the lead mule had stepped off into soft snow, broken a leg, and fallen back across the trail, blocking it completely. Yancey had been lucky to get himself and the rest of the mules out before they were buried alive. Any other man than Boston would have been turned back, but he had found that pocket blocked before and had discovered a way around it, backtracking a short distance. He dismounted and led his pony onto a narrow shelf that wound steeply up the rock face of the mountain. The footing was hardly fit for a mountain goat, but step by slow step Boston worked his way up the ledge and his pony followed, circling the pocket many feet above the blocked trail. They clung to the canyon wall like lizards, with the wind threatening to tear them loose at every cautious step. The climb was dangerous enough, but getting back down to the trail was far worse. The backlash of the wind whipped snow into their faces as if shot from a cannon, blanketing the smooth rock the light snow gave no footing, and Boston had to try each foothold carefully before he dared put his weight on it. 
one misstep would hurl him to the bottom of the gorge in an avalanche. Yancey, unable to be of any help, watched breathlessly as Boston worked his way cautiously down the canyon side. You'll never make it through, kid, he shouted as Boston led his trembling pony back onto the trail. Better hole up till this blow is over and they get enough mules in here to open up the trail. Shucks, this is nothing, Boston shouted back. You should see a January howler up here. Try to get that drift open. Yancey, I'll be back with the St. Joe mail in a week. See you later. Asta la vista. Then he was back in the saddle and fighting his way up the trail, head bent to the wind and arms thrashing to warm his blood. For one of the first times in his life, Boston lost all track of time in his fight to the top of the summit. He was unable to see more than a few feet ahead and had to be afoot most of the time, helping his pony through drifts, feeling his way along precipice edges and clambering up the steepest grades. The mule drivers had done their job as well as they could. They had kept three of the worst drifts passable, but had been unable to tramp out the rest of the trail as fast as the snow blew in. Time and again, Boston had to pick his way along a mountainside to get past a blockade. Twice after he reached the head of the river gorge, he became completely lost in the veering, shifting winds that swept around the high peaks. Only his knowledge of the mountains and his pony's instinct saved their lives. In one of his forced detours, Boston missed his last relay post on the western rampart. When he realized he was beyond it, it was too late to turn back. There was nothing to do but to help his already tired out pony as much as he could and push on. Weariness such as he had never known dragged at him in the thin air. Each foot seemed to be weighted with lead, and the drowsiness of cold and exhaustion numbed his brain. To fight off the drowsiness, he flailed his arms and slapped his face sharply, stirring the blood <clears throat> and driving it to his sleepy brain. From the pitch of the trail, Boston knew he was within a half mile of the summit when his pony floundered in a snowbank, fell, and was unable to rise. Hauling the mochila from the saddle, he threw it over his shoulders and staggered almost drunkenly up the last steep grade to the relay station at the summit of the Sierra <coughs> of the Sierras. Your plum beat out kid, the keeper told him. You stay here with me till this storm passes. Trailhead on the east sides twenty foot under snow, blocked solid. There couldn't no man get past nor through it. Thanks, Jim, Boston answered, but I'm going to make a try at it. If I can't get past, I'll be back. While you can still follow the tracks. I left. You might make a try at getting that pony of mine out of the snowbank. He's too good a horse to let freeze. With the wind from the northeast, the far shoulder of the summit was the trickiest spot on the crossing. There, the trail turned to the north angling sharply down the face of a bald stone mountain with a thousand-foot drop-off 
to a timber-lined gorge at the bottom, at the right. There was no possibility of circling above the blockade, but Boston thought he could get past in the gorge below. <clears throat> he remembered having once seen a game trail that wound through the timber there, high along the canyon side. If he could find it now and find his way back to the regular trail at the other end, the rest of the trip shouldn't be too hard. Just east of the summit, Boston turned his fresh pony off the trail and plunged it down over the rim of the gorge. Here the drop-off was not so steep as farther on, and not too far down. There was an aspen thicket to catch them if they tumbled. Squatting on its haunches, the pony kept right side up until they hit the aspen thicket. Then, bumping from tree to tree, it lost its balance and somersaulted, throwing Boston head over heels. It was a lucky fall. When Boston picked himself up, he found the, the tree trunks around him. Scarred with blackened lines, he knew them to be the markings left by deer and elk when scraping the spring fuzz from their antlers, so the trail must be close by. Remounting and following the thickest markings, he had no trouble in finding the trail he remembered, and as game trails always do, <clears throat> It followed the easiest route along the gorge side, covered by thick timber. It was protected from the wind, and blown snow sifted down gently through the trees. Boston had followed the game trail at a good pace for about two miles, when it left the heavy timber and came out into another aspen thicket. He recognized the grove in a moment, it lay just below the regular mule trail, halfway down the steep pitch from the summit. Quickly climbing to the trail above, he was surprised to find the snow barely knee-deep and not badly drifted. Here the force of the wind was far less than on the western side of the summit, and there was much less flying snow. A mile farther down the trail, Boston rode out from under the storm. The air cleared, and in the great basin below him, Lake Tahoe lay like a gigantic blue mirror more than a mile above sea level and surrounded by a high wall of jagged snow-capped mountains. Through the murk overhead, the disk of the sun shone dimly. Boston stared up at it in dis disbelief. It seemed a thousand hours since he had ridden out of the relay station at Hope Valley, but the sun was only about two hours past mid-sky. With only a few inches of snow on the ground, he put his pony down the last dip of the trail at a pounding trot, then galloped it across the valley, ten miles ahead where the California-Nevada line crosses Lake Tahoe, was Friday's station, the end of his route. It was 2.18 when Boston galloped his pony up to Friday's station and turned the mail over to Pony Bob Hoslam. In a howling storm that few men could have lived through, he had carried the first pony mail 55 miles across the high hump of the Sierra Nevadas in just eight hours, much better time than the schedule called for in summer weather. Chapter 6 Pony Bob 20 years old, weighing barely a hundred pounds, and as tough as spring steel, Pony Bob Hoslam was known all through the desert country as the Ridin' Fool, Pony Bob was one of the most daring horsemen who ever lived. 
hard riding, hard fighting, and sometimes seemingly reckless, but he was no fool, and he was out to show them eastern dudes that they were really in a race. A mile beyond Friday's station, Bob turned his galloping Mustang sharply from the lake, up a long sand dune, and into the mouth of a rough canyon. There he jerked the six-shooter from his belt, cocked it, and held it ready for action. The Powit Indians had been threatening to go on the warpath for months, and this was one of their favorite ambush places. Narrowing and becoming more rugged, the canyon snaked steeply up through pinnacled outcroppings of sandstone and enormous boulders, every one of them an ideal hiding place for an Indian on the warpath. Speed was the best defense against flying arrows in that narrow canyon, and Pony Bob had speed to spare. The mountain mustang he rode was less than half-broken, spur-shy, and tougher than raw hide. The day before, it had taken five strong men to hog-tie it and nail on its first shoes. The steep three-mile run up to Daggett's Pass would do it no harm. To make the poorest possible target, Pony Bob lay tight against the Bronco's neck, and he wasn't too careful with his spurs. Horse and rider came through the pass at the head of the canyon in a blur of speed. Quickly, Bob hauled the wild-eyed Mustang into a tight circle to stop its runaway dash. Even this mountain-born Mustang would break its neck if it hit the drop off too fast. Daggett's Pass stands at the top of the western mountain wall that rims the Nevada deserts. Steeper than a cathedral roof, the wall drops off more than 2,000 feet to the Carson River marshes at its base. A mule trail wound down the mountainside in a series of long loops, but Pony Bob didn't bother with the trail. He had picked and shod this particular Mustang for only two reasons. It was afraid of nothing and could slither down steep mountains without losing its balance. At the edge of the descent, Bob shoved the gun back into his belt, hauled his saddle cinch tight, pulled his hat snug, and touched the Bronco's flanks with his spurs. Leaping forward, the Mustang plunged over the rim, landing in a half squat. Hind feet spread wide, four legs set like bracing poles, and tail hugging the mountainside as a rudder. Skating, sliding, bouncing aside to avoid boulders and bushes, the Bronco streaked down the mountain in an avalanche of broken brush, snow, and rolling stones. With every muscle set for a quick leap, Bob threw his body from side to side, anticipating the Mustang's moves, going with them, and helping it keep its balance. By the trail, it was six miles to the foot of the mountain. The way Bob and his pony went, it was little more than a mile, and couldn't have taken over two minutes. The excited, half-wild Bronco hit the flat land at the mountain base in a series of bounding leaps, bogged its head, and went into a fit of bucking, happy and screeching like an Indian full of firewater. Pony Bob rode out the buck with spurs raking and hat fanning. Then, turning to the north, along the river edge, he raced the still-eager Mustang for the relay stop at Genoa and the old Mormon station, first white settlement in Nevada. Every mount in Bob Haslam's string 
was a half-wild bronco, a desert man. He had picked himself a string of mustangs that could match the desert's cruelty with speed and endurance. The twelve-mile trail to Carson City lay snowless and almost level. Up on another bronco at Genoa, Bob drove at top speed for the full distance. He carried neither rifle nor horn. He wouldn't be bothered with them. As he raced into town, he raised a war whoop that could have been heard at the top of the mountains. Carson City was then a city in name only, less than two years old. It was the supply town for the mines of the Comstock Load. Its one street was little more than a double row of saloons, a few assay offices, a general store, and the hotel that was the relay station. At the sound of Pony Bob's whoop, a crowd of miners gathered in front of the hotel, yelling and cheering. They scattered like frightened chickens as Bob raced his foam-spattered bronco straight at them. It was sliding to a stop when he flipped out of the saddle, bringing the mochila with him. Another flip and he was up and away on a fresh Mustang, racing for Dayton, his next relay post 11 miles to the northeast. Five miles beyond Dayton, he turned sharply to the east, following Carson River through a notch in a low mountain chain. Beyond the notch, the river spread out into a wide swamp, rimmed with bush and aspen and lying between barren desert hills. This was another favorite Indian ambush spot, safely demanded that a rider stay at least a gunshot away from the swamp. High along the rough hillsides, no one knew the danger better than Pony Bob, but he held his course tight along the hard ground at the swamp edge. In this way, he could cut the distance from Carson City to Fort Churchill to 35 miles and save at least 30 minutes. Lying flat on the neck, of a racing pony. He was a poor target for arrows, and the Nevada Indians had few good rifles. Pony Bob paid no attention to pacing his mounts as he rode. Born wild, descendants of Spanish war horses, these desert mustangs could carry a light rider at top speed for an hour or more. On this first trip, with the mail, Bob had no relay that long, so he drove for every ounce of speed in his horse's legs, cutting the scheduled time by nearly two-thirds at Reed's ten miles downriver from Dayton. Pony Bob changed mounts in twenty seconds and dashed away on the last fifteen-mile stretch of his route. The hands of the clock in the thick-walled adobe station at Fort Churchill stood at 535 when he streaked in and tossed the mochila to Bart Riles, the next pony rider. In 15 hours and 20 minutes, three determined riders, hardly more than boys, had carried the first Pony Express mail 185 of the most rugged miles on the entire route to St. Joseph. Only Pony Bob had thought of his ride as a race against the riders east of the Rockies, but they had made up the time lost by the antelope and had gained more than nine hours on the schedule set up by Mr. Russell. Chapter 7 the Prairie Riders. Because of the two-hour difference in time between the Midwest and West, Pony Bob was just making his relay in Carson City when Mel Vaughn galloped his winded pony into Fort Kearney. 
rough as Mel had been with Doc Brink for babying his horses, he cautioned Billy Campbell as he tossed him the mochila. Take it easy now, Billy. We're nigh on to three hours ahead of schedule already. If this rain keeps up, it'll be blacker than tar out there, and there'll be knee-deep mud for daylight. Don't run no risk of stirring up a stampede or playing a horse out and getting left afoot amongst them wolves and engines. There was good reason for Mel's cautioning. Billy was just past 18. His hundred-mile route lay in the Platte River Valley, and the only white men were those at the relay stations 25 miles apart. Elsewhere, the Indians roamed and wolves howled around the drifting buffalo herds. Regardless of Mel's warning, Billy had no intention of taking it easy. There was no telling how fast those riders west of the Rockies might be burning up the trail, and he didn't plan to lie back and let them steal the race. Murky twilight lasted for nearly an hour after he left Fort Kearney, and he made the most of it, keeping clear of the deep-rutted Oregon Trail. He headed straight westward at a smart gallop. By the time black darkness fell, he was halfway to his first relay station. Though he could see nothing himself, he knew from the sound of his horse's hoofs that it had returned to the trail and was following it. He pushed on at a brisk canter and had cut fifteen minutes from the schedule when he reached his first relay. Although wet and cold, Billy was in high spirits when he rode into Midway, his second relay station. In spite of the darkness and rain, he had gained another fifteen minutes, and the longest half of his route was behind him. His last mount had been one of the finest horses he had ever ridden. It was a sturdy, willing, and intelligent Morgan. Countless wolves had howled in the blackness around them, but the horse had shown no fear, sticking to the trail in a steady, ground-covering lope. Billy's third mount was a fine, bo fine boned high-headed Kentucky gelding. It reared and plunged when the mochila was thrown across its saddle, trying to break away and bolt back to the stable. Billy had seen plenty of home-run prairie horses and knew how to handle them. A good spurring would get the stable out of their minds in a hurry. Excellent rider and plainsman that he was, he knew nothing about high-strung racing horses. He leaped onto the unruly gelding's back, lashing with his spurs as he landed. Billy couldn't have made a worse mistake. The horse, unused to the wild country and already frightened, was thrown into a panic. The keeper should have known better than to send the horse out on such a night, but he shouted, that's the stuff, Billy. Give the crazy outlaw a taste of iron. Learn him who's the boss. It took Billy Campbell only a few minutes to realize his mistake. This gelding was no outlaw. It was a good horse, only young and panicked by fright. Billy tried to soothe and quiet it, but he was too late. The horse was now as afraid of the man on its back as of the wolves that howled in the darkness. Guiding himself by the speck of light from the station and holding his mount to a dancing, side-stepping walk, Billy tried to line him out on the westbound trail. When the horse had quieted a little, Billy let him lope slowly, weaving him back and forth, only enough to find and keep near the trail. For an hour, the system worked well. 
at a lope, the gelding was less nervous, and each time he struck the trail, he followed it <clears throat> a little better. Then suddenly, and from nearby, a wolf howled, rearing, whirling, and plunging at the sound. The frightened horse raced away through the blackness at breakneck speed. The Platte River, filled with quicksand, could be no more than half a mile away, and Billy couldn't tell whether his mount was racing toward or away from it. He could only haul on the reins, pull the gelding's head to one side, and try to turn him in a circle. The leverage of a curb bit on a horse's mouth is powerful and painful, but the gelding was panicked beyond the feeling of pain. Pull as he might, Billy couldn't bring the frightened runaway under control. His only comfort was that the horse must be running away from the river. If not, he would already have plunged into it. Billy's first fear was just passing when a worse one overtook him. From ahead and at both sides, he heard the sound of loud grunting. He knew it for the sound that sleeping buffaloes made when wakened and lunging to their feet. Short, angry bellows came from the darkness, then the pounding of a thousand racing hoofs. Billy nearly lost his seat as the gelding checked, wheeled, and raced again. Within seconds, they were in the midst of a roaring river of stampeding buffaloes. This was no time for gentle handling of the panicked gelding. And there was no use in trying to guide it with the reins. Billy grabbed the saddle horn with both hands, swung a boot high, and spurred hard on the neck and shoulder, forcing his horse away from the loudest roar, the center of the stampeding ho herd, battered from side to side. They were swept along like driftwood in a torrent, but the gelding managed to keep its feet. It seemed hours before the thunder of pounding hooves became less deafening and only stragglers raced around them still spurring billy drove the gelding outward until they were clear of the stragglers then turned him in a tight circle and brought him to a stop with the danger past his own nerves cracked for a minute. There, in the blackness and rain, both horse and rider stood trembling as if they had St. Vitus's dance. Billy Campbell was no man to let his nerves get the best of him for long. Fortunately, the mail was still safe, and it was his job to get it to Cottonwood Springs, as fast as he could. While he tried to decide which way to go, the reins pulled in his hand. The horse had raised its head and was looking around. It turned, took a few walking steps, then settled into a straightaway trot. That was enough for Billy. The horse had found his bearings and was heading for the stable. The only safety it knew if it was as smart as he thought, it would go to the Oregon Trail and try to follow this back to Mid Midway. Billy left the reins loose, letting the horse choose its own direction and speed. Shortly it moved into a lope, then a brisk canter, but held straight on. After three or four miles, Billy heard the splash of soft mud underfoot. He knew they were on the trail and felt sure they were headed east. A moment later, he knew he was right. The gelding fought the reins when he turned it around and forced it to go the other way. Soaked from head to foot, 
and shivering in the cold rain, Billy fought the gelding westward, hour after hour. It would not hold to the trail, kept trying to turn back, and had to be reined constantly. Six or seven times, a wolf howl sent it off in a runaway panic. Each time, Billy had to spur it into circling, let it find the homeward trail, then turn it back to the west. Gray dawn was breaking when he rode the worn-out gelding into his third relay station at Willow Island. The keeper offered to take the mochila on to the next station, but Billy wouldn't let him. Thank you kindly, he said, but I'm getting paid to carry the mail clean through to Cottonwood Springs, <clears throat> and I aim to do it without help. I already lost a heap of time, but in daylight I reckon I can make some of it up. Stopping only to gulp a cup of hot coffee, he swung onto his next horse and loped away. Even in daylight, Billy couldn't hold to the schedule. The night-long rain had soaked the Platte River Valley until a horse's hoofs cut into the pasterns. Although his mount was a good one, Billy was more than three hours in riding the last relay of his route. He had done the best he could, but had lost five hours on the schedule, the three the others had gained and two besides, dead tired from sixteen hours in the saddle. Billy Campbell could still joke when he rode into Cottonwood Springs, as little Yank snatched the mochila and threw it across his saddle. He snapped, You're two hours late, kid. That's no way to win races. I'm plumb sorry, Yank. Billy told him, but they give me a home and pigeon instead of a horse to ride out of Midway. As little Yank wheeled his horse away, he called back, Never mind, Billy boy, I'll make it up again, for I hit Julesburg. If you do, you'll need one of them horses with wings, Billy shouted after him. Little Yank had ridden less than a mile before, but he realized how right Billy had been. His route lay for 100 miles along the South Platte River, and the valley was a sea of mud. Although he was mounted on a fast thoroughbred, the heavy muck dragged at its hoofs, holding it back and sapping its strength. The best pace it could hold was a back-wrenching trot. Hour after hour, the rain fell steadily, the mud grew deeper, and little Yank grew more disgusted. Each of his first three mounts had been brought from Kentucky, and they were not yet accustomed to the wild country. The buffalo herds and the wolves that howled in the distance frightened them into wasting their strength in useless plunging. Yank was unable to judge their endurance, and either tired them too soon or failed to get the best out of them long before he reached his third relay station. Night overtook him, and with it the wolves grew bolder, their blood-chilling howls from the nearby darkness drove his horse into a wild panic, rearing and plunging, it tried to race away from each howl, but tired quickly in the deep mud, and could make little headway, the nerves under its hide began to quiver, and Yank knew it was nearing exhaustion. The wolves knew it too, and closed in for the kill. Little Yank emptied a revolver into the blackness, but the shots frightened his mount more than they frightened the wolves. 
he had barely brought the horse back under control when the pack was again at its heels. Yank didn't dare empty the second gun. In desperation, he snatched his horn over his shoulder and blew it with all his might. Startled yipes came from the darkness as the wolves drew back in fear. For two hours, Yank held the wolves off with his horn while his exhausted mount dragged on at a plodding walk. When at last they reached the relay station at Diamond Springs, the horse stood with its head hanging to the, gr to the ground, completely ruined. With darkness, a wind had sprung up. By the time Little Yank rode out of Diamond Springs, it had risen to a gale from the northwest, whipping the rain before it. At any other time, he would have hated to ride in such a storm, but that night it was a blessing. From it, he could tell his direction without following the Oregon Trail, and it drove the wolves to cover. Riding straight south across the drenched valley, Little Yank followed a winding gulch up onto the rolling hills of the high prairie, then turned so that the rain struck full against his right cheek. Julesburg, Colorado, the end of his route, would lie straight ahead, and up here on the hills the thick matted buffalo grass gave his horse good footing. Yank rode at a steady lope, slowing his horse only through hollows where buffaloes might be huddled away from the storm. His last 25-mile ride was by far his fastest and easiest, but it was nearly midnight when he forded the South Platte River and rode into Julesburg. Instead of making up any of Billy Campbell's time, he had lost another five hours, and it was only through an oversight that he had not lost six when Mr. Russell had laid out the Pony Express route schedules. He had made no allowance for the fact that a traveler must set his watch ahead or back one hour whenever he crosses a time zone, boundary line. Yank had started his ride in the central time zone and had gained an hour when near the first relay station. He rode into the mountain time zone. Even so, the mail had fallen seven hours behind schedule, and the race with the California and Mormon riders seemed as good as lost. Chapter 8 The Ambush Trail Billy Campbell was already nearing his first relay station when pony Bob Haslam streaked into Fort Churchill and flung the eastbound mochila to Bart Riles. In Nebraska, it was pitch dark, but on the Nevada deserts, it was still full daylight. Bart was a thin, quiet Mexican boy. He spoke almost no English, but was an excellent horseman and knew the Nevada deserts and mountains as no other except the Indians knew them. On the darkest night, he could find his way unerringly across the trackless wilderness. It was for this reason that he had been chosen to carry the mail east from Fort Churchill with Paiute Indian trouble brewing his 117-mile route to Smith's Creek was the most treacherous on the entire Pony Express Trail. Bart had not understood the pledge he was taking when he made an X behind his name and became a Pony Express rider, but he understood Pony Bob's guard con su vida 
y dal prisa amigo. Guard it with your life and hurry friend. Pony Bob was was Bart's hero, although Bart <clears throat> was inclined to be timid. There was no hardship or danger he wouldn't face to please Bob and win his praise. He raced his pony out of the fort as if Satan were on his heels. One sometimes thinks of the desert as a great expanse of barren, shifting sand, but the Nevada desert is quite different. It is broken by almost a hundred separate mountain chains, all running north and south, and the arid stretch stretches between are dotted with sagebrush and grease wood. Its few rivers have no outlets to the sea, but spread into great marshes before being swallowed by the thirsty soil. Nearly 500 miles of the Pony Express route lay through this desolate and uninhabited wilderness. Bart's first relay station was at the end of the Carson River Marsh, 30 miles east of Fort Churchill. To save a long ride around, the Pony Express Trail had been hacked through the willow and aspen thickets that dotted the swamp. In daylight, these were ideal Indian ambushes. At night, a rider on a racing horse gave the Indians no target, but the swamp was far from safe. It was the favorite hunting ground of lynx and cougar, and for miles the trail twisted through bogs so deep that they had to be matted with willow saplings. <clears throat> if a running pony missed a turn, it would be mired and the rider thrown. If not killed, he was an easy prey for Indians or wild animals. The sky was a sullen gray when Bart put his pony onto the marsh trail, flattened down to give the least possible target for bullets or arrows. He threaded the winding pathway at reckless speed for the remaining hour of daylight. Then the night settled, black and starless, over the treacherous bogs, Bart had to hold his pony to a walk, and there the mosquitoes swarmed in millions. They drove the pony frantic. And covered Bart's face in a stinging, blood-sucking mass. Bart's face was so swollen that he was hardly recognizable when, after three hours, he reached the still water relay post. To keep his eyes from closing completely, he smeared his face with grease, then flipped onto his mount and galloped away. On a starlit night, he could ride the twenty miles to Sand Springs in an hour and a half, but in the blackness it took an hour longer. It was just midnight when he rode in, made a fast relay and headed out for Cold Spring, 37 miles to the east and across the Stillwater and Clan Alpine mountain ranges. Bart was less than half hour out of Sand Springs when he spied three or four specks of light glimmering star-like through the blackness ahead. A few minutes later, the hoot of an owl came from the darkness behind him. Then, as if echoed back by the mountains, it came faintly from far ahead and above. Bart stopped his pony and sat watching and listening. That was no owl hoot, and those specks of light were not stars. Again the echo came, more faintly and from higher on the mountains. Then one by one, the specks of light disappeared. Carefully, Bart turned his pony off the trail, 
riding southward at a noiseless jog. Those specks of light had been from Indian campfires at the pass across the summit. The owl hoots were signals telling of his coming. In starlight, he would have risked running the ambush, but in the black darkness, it would be foolhardy. In that narrow pass, he would be trapped like a rat in a hole. There was only one way to get past the ambush. He would have to circle the end of the Stillwater Range. That would double the length of his ride, and in black darkness would be tricky business. For an hour, Bart rode in absolute silence, guiding himself by coyote howls that came now and again from behind and above him. These, too, were Indian signals, passing the word that he had left the trail and escaped. When he could no longer hear the howls, Bart stopped his pony and raised a coyote howl of his own, then listened for the direction and timing of the echo, using the mountains as a sounding board and guiding himself by the echo Bart rode as fast as his pony could pick its way in the darkness. At dawn, he had rounded the end of the range, but was 18 miles farther from Cold Spring than he had been at Sand Springs. Cutting straight eastward, he crossed the Clan Alpine Range at its lower end, then made the 40-mile waterless run to Cold Spring. It was mid-afternoon when he rode in on his completely spent pony. While Bart wolfed down beans and biscuits, Jim McNaughton, the keeper, warned him in a mixture of Spanish and English. During the night, the Desatoya Mountains had been speckled with Indian fires. The pass was sure to be ambushed. He must run no risk of being caught by the Indians and losing the mail. The keeper was still talking when Bart mounted and rode away. He had understood enough. With daylight and his knowledge of the mountains, he was sure he could get past the ambush. The Indians couldn't be everywhere. If they were watching the regular pass, he knew others that would be unguarded. There was only one spot on the 30-mile trail to Smith's Creek that worried him. That was Quaking Aspen Bottom between the Desatoya and Shoshone Mountains. There, the Pony Express Trail had been cut through a two-mile aspen thicket, and there was no way around it. Circling danger spots and threading his way upward through rugged canyons, Bart crossed the backbone of the Desatoyas, then cautiously slipped back to the trail near Quaking Aspen. Bottom. After resting his pony, he raced through the thicket amid war whoops and flying arrows, but came out untouched. It was past two o'clock in the afternoon when he reached Smith's Creek, Few men, if any, could have matched Bart's ride, but it had taken over twenty hours, three more than the schedule allowed. J. Kelly, though jockey-sized, was among the greatest of the desert riders, but he lacked Bart's uncanny ability to find his way through black darkness. Storm clouds blanketed the sky when he took the mochila from Bart and galloped away on his 116-mile route to Ruby Valley. Without sun, the desert afternoon was cool, and Jay had little need to spare his ponies. Like Bart, he had to avoid several Indian ambushes, but had few mountains to cross, and had covered 50 miles of his route by twilight. He was gloating over the place 
he was setting for them eastern braggers when his troubles began. The night fell dead black. His pony wouldn't follow the faint trail, and Jay lost half the night in blind wandering over the desert. Twice after daylight, he had to race for his life to get away from well-mounted warriors, and it was nine in the morning before he rode into Ruby Valley Station. He had not only lost all the advantage gained by his fast riding in the afternoon, but had fallen two hours behind the time established for his route.